I miss sleeping. How's your day today? I hope you're ready for what I'd like to say is basically an amazing adult project. I'm sorry for the mic. It I there ha I have two settings on this mic. It's either no noise at all or it sounds like I'm t whispering into your ear. So I'm sorry if it's either of those. But anyway, moving on. Let's begin. So, my first question. In life, some children are born into a life a little different than the average person. There are many disabilities around the world which people have to face on a daily basis. Would you think that most schools should accommodate students with a disability the most that they can instead of not accepting them into the school? So personally, I feel like schools should not let in people with disabilities. I think certain schools with certain standards should be set aside to take care of these students. So I'm not saying have a school just for them, but what I'm saying is certain schools, like for example, let's take real examples in real life. We take St. Thomas, BHS, and those schools still can accept regular students without disabilities, but they are the ones that accept all the students with disabilities not the major dis not the minor disabilities sorry the major disabilities so for example what you can do is a government if you were to accept all the disability students in each school the government would have to set aside money to each school to pay for subsidies to pay for um to pay for helpers for each student to pay for all the necessary extra costs it takes to help dis disability kids but if you put them all in one or two schools or three schools, then the government can give more money to those schools and centralize their help. So instead of having like two health workers, social workers in each school, you can have seven in one school. So personally, that's how I feel. And what I understand is why some schools will push them away. Like WIC, for sure, would push away any kid with a major disability like down syndrome or autism or something like that because those are hard to work with but when you take a look at something like dyslexia well that's pretty simple you just give them something that costs nothing an extra room and some extra time that can solve a big problem so someone with a minor disability like that you don't really need to set aside a school for them because it costs nothing extra it's a simple solution to the task like, for example, for me, I have dysgraphia. It's a rare case, and it's a simple solution. I just have a computer for long essay tests. But for someone with autism, there would be a lot of care they would need. So that would be better if they were in a school that was equipped for that, specifically for them. Now let's move on to the next question. Hmm. All right. At the placement JFK... There are students learning there until age 21. It is a special way for them to learn and understand, and it is a real privilege for them to be attending it. On the other hand, most schools that do accommodate students with a handicap, there is a tuition fee, but not most people can afford it. Should schools with these accommodations have free? So this almost relates back a bit to what I was saying in the last question. Personally, I feel like schools need fees. If you're going to take care of students with disabilities, you need a fee because you have to pay for the social workers and any other extra resources you need. But I think the best way to go about this is to take away the fees and all, all the costs that they need, the government would pay for. Because if you think like, if you think, okay, First of all, the goal here would be to abolish fees because that would be the best thing because then all the students can get to go to school and can learn, and that's the goal. So let's say we just take away the fees. No government help, just take away the fees. Well, then the school is cutting costs around the school, so all the students suffer for a few students with dis disabilities. So, like, the school doesn't get a new gym because they have to pay for another classroom to help for um, kids with Down syndrome. But if the government were to give that money to make that new class, then the rest of the school would get that new gym, and they would be able to benefit from the school's prosperity and 
the disabled kids can get what they need to learn. So, let's move on to the next question. Question number two. People around the world show their religion in many different ways. In one religion, women wear hijabs around men as a respect to for their religion. If these women were to play, for example, soccer, the ref would make them either take it off or not play. Do you think it's right that people in certain religions can't express their respect for it when competing in a sport? This question has a lot of sides to it because one, there's the religious side, and two, there's the actual sport side. Sure, you're going to have some refs who are actual racists and don't like a different re religion. And they're going to say, oh, you're Arab, you're wearing a hijab, so nope, nope, you're gone. Please leave. Thank you. Oh, you're Jewish and wearing a yarmulke? Please leave. Thank you. You know, that's going to happen. That you can't do anything about. That is a culture that you have to work through and you have to promote cultural acceptance and promote all that and hopefully in the generations to come people like that no longer exist uh, lo no longer exist but let's look at the actual sorry i hit my mic one second okay that's good so let's look at the actual cultural not the culture sorry i'm so sorry let's look at the sport aspect of this so in this question we have the example of soccer now soccer is not a contact sport but there's a lot of bumping into people there's a lot of like movement it's not directly physical but you have slide tackles you have you have multiple movements that you come into contact with other people and wearing a hijab can be a problem because you can slide into someone their finger gets stuck and boom that person has a broken finger that would not be great so personally i feel like what they need to do is they can wear their hijab but they need to wear something on top of it to cover it like for example in rugby what they could do is a hijab would not be permitted permitted at all because 100% someone would get injured like smashing into it or something like that. But what is permitted is something called a scrum cap. And so what they could do is they could wear their hijab and put the scrum cap on top. And that's like a, it's a padded helmet that they can wear without changing anything about them. So they get to wear their hijab and they get to play the sport too. So they would need to find something to wear during soccer maybe possibly tape it up so that there are no holes for fingers to get stuck possibly an idea i think that is the best solution for this problem so let's move on to question four not many first immigrant children have access to help with their homework whether it be with their because their parents do not speak the language or they are not home to help because they're working one or more jobs. However, do you think that helping children with homework is really the best way to save their time, like PCP? Do you think that there are better ways to volunteer that will make more of an impact on the community, like helping a hospital, building schools, providing food to the homeless? This question, personally, I'm on both sides. Um, but I am on one side more than the other. Because helping students with their learning is very important. Because without places like PCP, there's nowhere else they can get their help. At home, their parents can't really help them. Either they don't know the language, or they can't help them because they're not physically at home. So a PCP is a great place for students. But what I think, from my personal experiences, I don't know about other places, but PCP itself, and I think... This is what it's like, excuse me, for other placements that have help student learning help. I think there are too many people there. When I went, there were times where each student had a person helping them, and that's great. I mean, even one time, there was so many people, there were more helpers than students, and that's great. Every student gets the help they need, and they get to succeed. But personally, I feel like there needs to be less. I feel like maybe five students per person would be much better because those other people that don't need to be at PCP can be doing something else. Obviously, the students are still getting help and not the help they were getting before, but they're getting enough help to get through and to learn and to understand the concepts. But those other people, they can be helping an understaffed hospital. They can be working with pets, like at the animal shelter that doesn't have many people helping them. They could be helping the homeless. There's many other problems that are life-threatening 
than not understanding how to multiply. So I think we shall move on to question five. All right, let's begin. Not many first-generation immigrants have access to help with their homework. Oh, I'm s oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was reading the last question. Wow. Oof. Okay. Uh, let me restart that with the actual fifth question. With ISIS terrorizing the Middle East, many immigrants are moving to European countries for safety. The problem is some of those countries cannot support the population they currently have, and any increase would be a great detriment to the economy and way of life. Are these countries in the right by turning away immigrants and increasing border security, or should they be taking in any and all immigrants, no matter how it impacts the country? Personally, my stance would be to set a limit of immigrants that can come into the country. Because it depends on the country. If you send, if you say the Euro must accept all immigrants, no matter who comes, well then, the Euro is big. You have places like Greece, who their economy is destroyed. They have nothing. So they ca there's an island in Greece that can barely afford to feed their people, let alone immigrants coming in. But then you look at Germany. Germany is a place that their economy is prosperous and great. If you send immigrants there, there's work for them, there's money for them, there's food, there's shelter, there's everything. So that's a great place for immigrants to go. The problem is, they're coming from the Middle East. So if you look at a world map, as they're coming in, the first place they go is through the Mediterranean into Greece. And most of them stay there. Some of them move, keep going north and get to Germany and places like that. The problem is the majority stay in places like Greece where there isn't a lot of work, there isn't a lot of food, there isn't a lot of money. So I think that each country should have a set limit of how many immigrants they can take in. They look at their books, they see, all right, we have this much excess, we have these many homes, we have this, et cetera, et cetera. We can take in X amount of immigrants. Once that limit is reached, first come, first serve, we stop. We cannot take in any more immigrants. And then Germany would have a number like 3 million. Greece would have a number like 200,000. And both of them would be able to take in immigrants without completely destroying the citizens who are already in that country. Now let's move on to question six. I hope you're enjoying so far the presentation by Alessandro de Pizzo. It's a personally I find it's a very good presentation so far. Question six. Everyone thinks differently about life, which makes the world have different ethics. A lot of misfortunate things happen on the street where people can see, but only some people will do something about it. If you were to be on the scene of a fight, would you be the one stopping them, watching them, calling for help, or according them to share? This question is cut and dry, simple. You call for help. You get the police on the phone, you tell them there's a fight going on, and you wait for them. Because here are the reasons why you would not want to do anything else. First of all, let's start with recording. Who would record a fight? You're just going to sit there while someone is getting the life beaten out of them and just record it. That's what you're going to do? That's right. You're doing a great job to society. Thank you so much. See, Recording is the exact same like watching them, but people who watch have the excuse like, oh, I was terrorized with fear, I just froze, I couldn't do anything. You can't say that when you're recording because, oh, I was terrorized with fear, and then I took out my phone and started recording them. Yeah, no, that does, it doesn't work that way, no. So that's why I think recording is a terrible thing to do. Watching, I can understand why some people would be scared, but... When someone chooses to watch, they say, oh, there's a fight going on. Huh. I guess I'm just going to sit here and watch. Let's pull up a chair and get some popcorn. That is a terrible thing to do. Because you could be helping that person. One of those people may possibly have a chance of dying. And you're just going to sit there and watch. Let's move on to actually s trying to get in and stopping the fight. Now here, it on the surface, it sounds like a good idea. Because you're stopping the fight. And... You're actually stop. You're you're like physically stopping it. So if there were to be a death or a severe injury, you would stop that from happening. The problem is, 
that puts you in danger, and that gives a chance for you to die or for you to get that severe injury. So, personally, I feel like you call, like calling the cops is the best thing to do because they are equipped to deal with this, they are trained to deal with this, and they are the ones who are least likely to get injured while trying to stop it. Yes, it will take some time for them to get there, but personally, I feel like that's worth my life and the life of others. And those are all my questions. So thank you for listening to uh, the Piche Podcasts. I hope you had an, an, an enjoyable time listening to this. And I hope you have a great summer break. And I hope your cruises do well. Um, I'll see you next year. I think we have ethics. I'm not sure, to be honest. Hopefully we do, because it's a joy being in your class, Mrs. Go. All right. Have a great night or day, depending on when you're listening to this. Goodbye.